Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our consideration is the Gospel reading that we just heard. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? It is of no small significance that St. Matthew tells us where Jesus poses his question to the Twelve. But then again, then again, there is not a single word in all of the Holy Scriptures that is not significant. Jesus was in the region of Palestine like we are in the region of the foothills. Within that region, there were several major cities. Jesus has brought his disciples to the city that was called Caesarea, of which there were many. But this one specifically was the Caesarea of Philip, where, just, where Philip was the governor of the region. This Caesarea was about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Among the several things that Caesarea of Philip was known for were its many, many temples. Some records state that there were 14 temples just in one neighborhood of the city, each one dedicated to the worship of a different god. The most notable temple was made out of marble and dedicated to Caesar himself, whom every loyal Roman was bound to confess to be Lord and Son of God. And so, what an intriguing place for Jesus to bring his disciples to ask this question, who do the people say that I am? The question is very broad, very general. The disciples answer with what they've observed or heard on the street. Some are saying that you are John the Baptist. Others are saying that you are Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It was probably out of either politeness or embarrassment that they left out, and some say Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Again, all very general. Some say, others say, no one specifically. But that's not really what Jesus is after here. He already knows what people are saying about him. It becomes obvious that he has just been setting his disciples up for another question that is very specific, very personal, that cuts right through all of the generalities, even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, to the, discern the thoughts and the intentions of the individual heart. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Here is the question that lies at the heart, the very heart of the Christian faith. Who do you say that Jesus is? So before we go any further with this, I have to apologize, but there are simply some grammatical analyses here that need to be done in order to hear this text correctly. The you here in, but who do you, say that I am, is plural. As you'd say, but who do y'all say that I am? He's speaking to his 12 apostles upon whom he will build his church, his one holy Christian and apostolic church. The question he asks is, how will you all speak about me when I send you out to all nations? to baptize, and to teach. What will you say about me? Who do you say I am? That's the most critical question that the church can ever wrestle and deal with. Their answer will determine the foundation upon which the Christian church will be built. Who do you say I am? It will become the question that will be the basis for individual people like you and me to say and confess, 
who we believe that Jesus is. Which is to say, the confession of the 12 apostles, the plural, you, has got to be right on this question if the singular, you and me, is to be answered correctly. For this question is not only critically important for the 12 apostles, but also for you and me, singular. For the truth is, the church may be as right as Peter's answer to the most important question ever asked, but apart from individual faith, personal faith, it is of no benefit to you, singular. You can be buried with your baptismal certificate and confirmation records in hand, but apart from faith in the word and the promise of God that stands behind them, it will do you no good. Individually, these 12 men to whom Jesus puts his question will at times answer this question with a remarkable lack of faith. Peter himself being the most notorious. I never knew the man. All of them will run away in fear for their own lives because they cannot answer his question with the firm assurance that they do here in Caesarea Philippi. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. The church must be clear in how it answers this question. Because unless the church can say and proclaim and shout from the rooftops that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, individuals like Peter and the others, individuals like you and like me who fall into doubting and confusion and despair don't stand a chance to ever get it right. Who will tell us that it's safe to come back home again if the church isn't sure where home is. Who will say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you, singular, all of your sins, if the church isn't sure that all of our sins haven't been completely atoned for by Jesus, the Son of God? Or as Jesus himself puts it, can a blind man lead a blind man? No, they will both fall into the pit. But who do you say that I am? This is the question that Jesus is putting to his church that is embodied in these 12 apostles. And he is deliberately putting this question to his church that is surrounded with the magnificent and the impressive temples of Caesarea Philippi, each one declaring that the God of that temple is the true Lord, the God that demands your worship. If we could only for a moment begin to comprehend the terrifying danger and terrible risk that Jesus takes in asking his disciples this question, which is this, from where will you get your answers to my question? On what will their answers be based? Will they look outwards? That is, to the pollsters and the politics and the current social movements of the day, will their answer to his question be based on what they are all saying? Or will they look inwards to what their own heart tells them, that sinful, fallen, corrupt, dead heart that we all possess? Or will they huddle up and caucus until they find a suitable compromise, an answer that is carefully constructed to include bits and pieces of everyone's belief so that no one feels excluded, but which in the end is what no one actually believes? Or will they express their own belief, but make it so darn personal that what may be true for you, may, me, may not be true for you at all? Or will they do what we all are all prone to do 
nowadays and make it all about our performance. You are a miracle worker, an exorcist, a great teacher, a good person, but never answer the question, who is he? Who do you say that I am? Can we begin to see how dangerous this question is and what a risk Jesus is taking in asking it? And if so, then maybe we can also begin to understand Jesus' remarkable response to Peter. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's not just that Peter has got that right answer that Jesus is so relieved to hear. It's where the answer comes from that Jesus praises. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. At this point in their journey, these 12 disciples have been with Jesus now for two years. Think of all that they have heard and witnessed. And yet, Jesus does not pronounce his blessed are you upon them because they've been such good students and are now ready to pass the exam. If anything, what we have seen so far in this journey is a startling lack of comprehension and faith on the part of these 12. No, the focus here is on my Father who is in heaven, who has revealed this to you. It's the only question on the most important exam that you will ever be given. And the Father has revealed the correct answer to you. You would never in a billion years have gotten this question right, except the Father reveals it to you. Luther captures the essence of Jesus' response to Peter in his explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I cannot by my own reason or strength I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. And in the same way, he calls, gathers, and enlightens his whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in this one true faith. And so thanks be to God then that our Lord does not leave it up to us to figure out the answer to this most important question. All of the danger and the risk in his question has been relieved. The Father reveals the truth about Jesus to us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to us through the apostolic word. And we may make Peter's confession our own, knowing that it has not come from within us or from what the people are saying, but from our Father who art in heaven. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. There is yet another physical feature of the area to which Jesus has brought his apostles that is I think important, significant for us to recognize here. Some research has indicated that there is archeological evidence that points to the fact that in Caesarea Philippi, there was a huge rock that was well known to all and it was commonly referred to as the gate to hell. Who knows that Peter hadn't gathered his 12 right in front of this rock when he declares, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We need to let this word sink into our ears and deeply into our hearts. First, Jesus calls this confession the rock on which the church is built. This is what the church is all about. 
It's not about beautiful buildings made out of marble or on worship attendance or on denominational loyalties or on the right social and political agenda. It is all about confessing Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so the first thing that the church must always keep right is its priority. It must first and foremost proclaim Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Second, Jesus calls this church that is built on the right confession of faith, my church. On this rock I will build my church. Long before this, the same Christ put it in this way. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, for you are mine. This is the language of a husband for his bride. You are my wife. I have laid down my life for you. And so the second thing that the church must always keep right is its identity. This is his church. It belongs to him. And you are members of this church and therefore also belong to him. You are his. Third, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In a day when nothing seems sure and everything seems so fragile, and who knows what tomorrow will bring and what this world will look like a year from now, even in the best of times, as death gets closer to us one day at a time, this much, this much we know for sure, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church that is built on the right confession of Christ, the Son of the living God. There are two things that are ultimately certain, and they are not death and taxes. They are the return of Jesus in great glory and the preservation of his holy Christian church until that day comes. And so the third thing that the church must always keep straight is its hope. How does the familiar hymn put it? Built on the rock that the church, built on the rock the church shall stand, even when steeples are falling. It is to this church that he calls my church, that the Christian church that confesses the revealed truth about the Christ, that Jesus entrusts with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is the church that knows how to use these keys rightly, unbinding the chains of guilt and the fear of judgment for those who confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, by unlocking the forgiveness and life that he won for us all on his cross, and fervently praying for those who refuse to confess even while they remain bound. And so the fourth thing that the church must always keep straight is its responsibility. Responsibility to use these keys for their intended purposes. The forgiveness of sins and the exercise of church discipline faithfully. These are the keys and the only keys that have the power to unlock the gates of hell and set the captives free. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Here is the only part of our text that simply does not apply to us today. The Christ, the Son of the living God, has been crucified. He has descended into hell, and it had no hold on him whatsoever risen from the dead because the grave also had no hold on him. He ascended into heaven from whence he will come down again to be our judge and set us all free. 
He has sent his apostles to go to all nations, confessing him to be the Christ in a world of idolatry, paganism, and skepticism. And today, today here, right now, in this place, you and I confess the truth about Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Knowing that by this confession, the gates of hell are opened. The lost are found and brought home. Heaven itself is opened, and we are blessed. Amen.